Oh, good evening, everybody. Alan Slaughterzinski for the Brevard Sports Network. And uh, we continue, or I should say, wind down here with our summer series of interviews. And, of course, uh, no summer series of interview here in our studios would be complete without my guest here tonight. Uh, we had him in last year as he was set to take over uh, the Melbourne girls basketball team. And after year one, uh, we've brought him back to see how that season went and what the future holds for the Lady Bulldogs. Please help me welcome here back in studio tonight, Mr. Colin Turry. Coach, uh, first of all, welcome back. Good to have you. How you been? Make sure you talk in to pull that mic a little bit closer. All right. Yep. How's that? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Alan. I'm happy to be here. And, um, Everything's going quite well. Yeah. Uh, just uh, progressing health-wise and just listening to uh, my body and getting some things taken care of. As You've been through it, haven't you? A little bit. A little yeah. bit. God bless you, not, man. Not I, that anyone can't handle, though. Yeah, you look great. Um, you know, based off of what, and we won't get specific, but based off of what you've been through at our age, how do you do it? How do you still do it? Uh, that's a great question. I have no idea. <laughs> Um, probably just my, uh, my faith in the big man yeah, and, uh, just the guidance of my coworkers and, uh, the staff at Melbourne yeah, and then, um, my daughter and my players, uh, motivate me to keep pushing and, uh, if they're willing to push and get better, then I'm going to keep pushing and get better myself. So you made a big jump last year. Um, you went from a program that you had built to a, a perennial District uh, FHSAA, uh, you know, playoff team to Melbourne girls basketball, which had really fallen on uh, so, some hard times. And, you know, you look at the year before you took over, 1-21, and 21, but you had an improvement last year. And, you know, you win a couple of games last year. Talk a little bit about your season last year, uh, your first year at Melbourne. Uh, well, anytime you take over a rebuild, um, it's never going to be quick or nope. easy. Um, a lot of it has to do with scheduling and where you think your team might be able to get to. Um, we came close to uh, getting over the hump uh, last season. We, we won three games, um, but we were in uh, a, good, a good percentage of those games as well that we had lost. So I was very encouraged um, not ever. Nobody wants to lose, obviously. Um, and some of the games that we played, we got completely destroyed. However, my girls never gave up. They just keep coming back for more, and uh, really kept pushing to get better every day. So that's catapulted us into this summer, in which we've had a had a pretty good run in June um, at the summer league that we hosted. And uh, I was pretty proud of the girls and their efforts, and uh, just watching them grow as a group. In 12 games, what'd you say you went? We went seven and five. Nice, yeah. nice, yes. good, good. Glad to hear it. Um, how how do I ask this? Uh, based off of your experience, and I've seen you operate uh, on the sidelines, and I know at times it can be a frustrating job, and at times it's a, it's a very rewarding job. But you know, used to putting fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen wins on the board. How were Kellen? How were you able? to change your mindset, to accept the fact that you would win three of 26. Sure. And how were you able to come up with that? You know, I, I couldn't find that type of patience at my age, at our age, I should say. Yeah. I mean, it's tough, but yeah. how, how were you able? Do you have to reset? I mean, tell me about that. Well, I don't think you change um, your philosophy or, or your approach because if you did that, you wouldn't ever get to that next level. So right. You have to maintain that. And, and, and keep that example for the team to, you know, strive to right. achieving at some point. And at some point, they will eventually get over the hump. But in order to keep coming back for more, as, as you know, you could say, it's really about the kids. It's, it's really about, you know, every day in practice, looking at the smiles on their faces, um, the appreciation that they have for you and your coaches day in and day out, just for being there and, and – I don't want to say agreeing to, but committing to making them better. And that's what kept me going back. And, and, and yeah, losing sucks. I, like every other coach, hate to lose. However, 
those kids have been in such a difficult position for the last three years that anything we did was going to be an improvement from what they had already experienced. So the level of gratitude and appreciation was far greater than what I have received in some of my other teams in coaching. And so that's what kept me coming back. You had four seniors uh, on the team last year, and yes. uh, you return a lot of the of the girls that uh, helped propel this team last year. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of those players that are coming back sure. uh, that you're going to need to count on in 2023-2024. Well, it's no secret that the bulk of that roster is now juniors. So I have five juniors um, that have been together um, for, for a good amount of time right now. So we're going to rely heavily on them for starters. And then we've got some, some really talented freshmen coming in from uh, some of our other middle schools that, that feed Mel High. And we got a chance to meet them this summer. And, man, do they change the whole dynamic of the team. So really excited to see them coming out um, at tryouts and, and just stay involved and build the chemistry with the, with the team as we approach the fall. And, uh, you know, we start our weight program and things like that. Here with uh, Colin Turry, the head coach for the Melbourne Lady Bulldogs. And uh, what will you do differently this year that – uh, as opposed from what did you learn last year and going three and 23? What was the biggest lesson perhaps that you took away as a coach that's been doing this forever, as a damn good coach that's been doing this forever? Uh, obviously, when you go through a season like that, you learn things about yourself um, and about your coaching. What was it that you learned? Well, personally, I it was a reminder for me that um, sometimes it's really okay to go back to the basics. And I had to – remind myself and bring myself down to say, hey, look, this is, this is very elementary right now, and, and we need to refocus where, where our efforts are going to be in practice because we only have so many minutes to get through. And so whereas previous teams, I might have been covering more situationals and things that might you know, get us over a, a certain game scenario, this team was more about individual skills and drills. And so we spent more time. Fundamentals. Doing that. Yes. Um, than, than I probably spent in the last, I will say, seven years of coaching the sport. So I had to just retrain my brain that, hey, man, it's almost like you're in your rookie season as a coach. It's time, we have to go back to that level and then, and then bring it as we can, the little things, um, just to keep them motivated and, and engaged. What was your first year as varsity coach and doing anything? Uh, first year head varsity. Um, for any sport? Yeah. I, it, I was it. the athletic director of Holy Trinity from 05 to 07, and right. I coached the golf team, All boys, right. boys and girls. So you've seen quite a lot in the 20, almost 20 years now that you've been actively involved in one way or another with varsity sports. Oh, yes. Um, what would you say just since then to now has changed the most? What's been the biggest change you've seen in both the student-athlete and in the way things are done? Ooh, that's a good question, Alan. Um, the biggest thing that jumps out to me is, um, I would say loyalty. There really isn't much loyalty anymore in terms of high school athletics. Um, everybody's out to get theirs, quote unquote. And if, um, if the kids really like their coach and really enjoy what, what they're doing at that school, they should stay at that school. Right. Um, I, I don't really... There, there's such a dynamic and, and a cosmic shift in terms of philosophies, in terms of, you know, you have to do this for exposure, you have to do that for exposure, and you don't really have to do any of that. You can play at your high school and then do your travel teams during the travel season, and you're still going to get exposure. Now, if your high school coach isn't providing that to you and, and helping you with that, that's a different circumstance. Right. Um, and I also have noticed a little bit of a drop-off in terms of um, the student-athlete's dedication to perfecting the craft. Uh, there's so many distractions that, that have grabbed their attention and their time that unless they're really, you know, truly being, being recruited or being, you know... It really is just a hobby. That, it is. It's a hobby. And it's, so you're seeing less teams... Justin, I mean, even Justin Brevard, where they're not making that next level jump 
in the regional playoffs or even getting to the state final four? I want to go back to the transfer part of it because I, I, I would assume you feel the way that I do about it. Um, we share a lot of similarities in that, you know, you know, when I was obviously, you know, I'm the old man that says stay off my lawn, but, you know, you go back to the days of, you know, whatever your, your, your electric bill says, your address is where in the hell you should be playing right. high school sports. Right. Now, I get it. Things happen. But let me backtrack a little bit because Caleb brought up a very good point, and I'm curious to get your take on it. Okay. Have the parents and even to a certain degree the coaching changed a little bit because there was a young man that transferred from Rockledge football to Cocoa Beach, okay. which is an unusual transfer for football. Sure. Usually it's the other way. But it was the parents and coaches, so to speak, that threw the comments down that quite honestly shocked me about the kid. Oh. And so what and, – and I was very disappointed okay. in these – I mean, I'm, I'm just telling it like it is. I was extremely disappointed for this young man that he had to even look at a comment in a negative fashion. Yeah. Um, so parents and, and some coaches, you know, in some – areas you know look coaches are younger these days a lot lot younger and i get that in a lot of ways that's a good thing because they can relate to you know the things that go on that cause the distractions right sure but what's the biggest change you've seen in terms of parents and the new generation of coaching well i think you know there's some instances of coaching where it, it's never going to change you gonna right. come in with your philosophy, you're going to tell the parents you can do X, Y, and Z because in your mind those three things make you credible to the parents and will make that athlete want to be there to play for you. What's that the, sense. Yeah, it does. What's the best way, in your opinion, to introduce a parent to a program? you got an incoming freshman, yeah. a good one. Yeah. What's the best way to introduce that parent? Because as a coach, obviously you want the parent's involvement, but you want it from a distance. Sure. How do you approach that these days? Uh, I don't. I don't know the answer to that because I, whoever shows up in my gym is who I coach. Right. So I, in terms of, you know, for the for the parent side, if if they if I know they're coming, you know, the right way. Right. Yeah, uh, they're coming to Mel because they're supposed to be at Mel, kind of a thing. Come to a practice. Just sit on the sidelines and take a look and see how we do things. And, and you know, if, if it's for you, great. If it's not for you, that's okay, too. Um, but that's not to say there's a support where come watch a practice and if you don't like what you see, you know, go to the school down the road instead. That's, that's kind of what occurs in some instances as well. So, you know, I personally just, just be genuine and upfront about what you do and how you do it. And what your expectations are. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Because then Well, you no don't get that no a lot. Secrets. There's no secrets with the parent at that right. point, right? No, I mean, and what I mean by that, what I mean by you don't get that a lot is that, unfortunately, what I'm seeing more and more of is that the parent and the coach are hesitant. That, you know, they, they, they tiptoe to, the, to meet in the middle. Things don't get said. And then what ends up happening is when there's one incident or t things build up. See that, so so there's yeah. nothing that's established at the beginning right. to, for, for groundwork. And you know what? And the parents have every – that's your child. Parents have every right to lay a foundation for what their expectations are from a program for their child. I yeah. get it. Right. But as a coach, you have to say, I understand. Here's how we do things. See, the biggest way that I've approached that – I. There's a, there's a handbook. There, there's a team handbook. These are our rules. These are our expectations. There's a player-parent contract. All this is covered in the parent meeting at the beginning of the year once we've had our tryout. So now your daughter has made my team. We're invested in you. Here's where we need you to invest in us. Ask now, and we'll be happy to tell you. Right. So we have that dialogue in the That's beginning. the right way, though. We have that, in, but that's the only way I know, Alan. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know what other programs do in that regard. I don't know if they just pick their team and they never even have a parents meeting or a well, uh, uh, it, a, in a lot in a lot of ways, it's there's the parents meeting. You know what? 
uh, it, sometimes it's the mentality parents should be seen and not heard, and that's not right. No. That's not right at all. As a parent myself, I would disagree yeah, with that. Yeah, I mean, and then there are those that say, you know, you know, this is high school now, you know, this is not Little League, or this is not this, that. There's got to be a happy ground. And the reason I bring this up is because it's an ongoing issue, as you know. Sure. And it's not going away. No. And with the advent of how social media is absolutely ridiculous with keyboard warriors and things of that, it certainly isn't going to get any better. Right. So I was curious how a coach like yourself that's been doing this a long time, that's you know that kind of has those old school beliefs, but yet understand what new wave methods can do for programs. Sure. How you approach that? Oh sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're very we're very flexible with that. Um, my staff and I, in terms of meshing the old school with the new school and uh, making sure everybody's comfortable with what's going on and the information. You have to be these so. days. You just you simply have to be here with Colin Turry. And, uh, Coach, uh, what are your expectations uh, and your goals for your program this year? Obviously, last year it was to establish you and in, in, in the way that you do things and what your expectations are moving forward. What would you like to see from this group this season? Well, to be honest, the way our schedule's laid out, we've got some pretty good balance of tough schools and, and – um, some schools that we know we're going to be competitive with. So my expectation is to at least go 500. Right. Uh, I, I think we can easily – I don't. well, I don't want to say easily. That's probably the wrong word. I think we can achieve a, a 15 and 10 type of a season if we continue to build off of what we showcased in June. And, and that being said, I still don't know who else or who has shown up at Mel that might – you know, come to tryouts and things of that nature. So okay. I'm really basing that off of my returners plus the few incoming freshmen that I uh, was able to coach in June, which was pretty fun. Yeah, they were they were pretty amazing kids. So take, take a look at this schedule. What's, it's not up yet. No, I haven't posted it yet. That's all right. Stop that's secret, a, Alan. That's all right. Okay. <laughs> all right. You make sure you get it to us first. <laughs> uh, all right. So that's the basketball side of it. What the hell happened to your Mets? They're horrible. They're terrible. Was yeah. it all Edwin Diaz this year? Was it losing Edwin Diaz? Did that set the mindset for that team moving forward? I don't know, man. I mean, top closer in the game last year. and then Yeah. They won 100, what, 101 games or something? Yeah. Now they suddenly can't hit a baseball? I mean, how does Jeff McNeil suddenly not know how to hit a baseball after winning the batting title? And Buck Showalter, he's, I, I love Buck, but he's got to go. His middle relief is awful. It's terrible. He leaves these guys in there to friggin' blow games. If you hit a... If you hit a batter, you should be pulled right there. It, it I don't is, understand. It is a minus nine in run uh, differential. And I tell you, and I know it's painful to watch. It and, is painful. And, and, I, and I feel bad for you. I stopped you. watching, Alan. I, 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 <laughs> yeah. So is it time to offload the Scherzers of, of the world? I mean, yeah, I mean uh, is it time to make those trades? They say no because they're only eight and a half games out of the wild card still. But is the pitching staff really going to get any better? I'll take Max. $46 million, go get it. We'll rent him. Everybody will rent it. Right. Yeah. We'll rent him. I'll take him. The Orioles need some pitching. The Orioles, Orioles. are damn good right now. Yes, they, they are. They don't need a lot of pitching, Alan. They don't need a lot. So <laughs> enjoy that one. Yeah, last yeah. year I sat here with my head socked, and as you kicked me, See? just reminding me of 69 and how good you were going to be and or were. And yeah. It's all right. all right. The Jets. You're a Jets fan, right? Oh, Giants. Buddy. Giants. 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 Yeah. Giants. Is Daniel Jones a uh, $40 million quarterback? No. <laughs> Caleb in the background no, I, laughing. No, I, I, don't, I don't believe that at all. But God bless him. Good for him. Is, is, now, we talk about coaching, right? Uh, how does his name even elude me? The, the head coach of the Giants. Brian Dayball. Brian Dayball, who was Josh Allen's offensive coordinator in Buffalo and now the head coach of the New York Giants. It, was that really just the difference for Daniel Jones? Was Brian Dayball, you think? I would have to say yes. Yeah. Because as, as a coach, a lot of times that's all a player needs is, is a certain personality that either shows they care or understands what's needed for that player to grow and develop. And so it doesn't change just because it's pro sports. 
with uh, real quick back to high school. I meant to ask you this when we were talking high school. I don't mean to be all over the place, but it's okay. a summer series interview. It's like <laughs> a beach ball. You can knock that thing all over the place. Um, shot clock. Yeah, bring it. How much would it cost per school to do that? Do you know? Uh, most of the most of the Brevard schools that I know of. Because you got to have two. Have it, don't we? I mean, Heritage has two. I believe on each scoreboard they've got them. And then, I don't, I don't know, but, you, but you'd have to hire somebody to operate it, right? You would have to have a second, yeah, they're next to the clock operator. You just yeah. Have Should we be playing with one right now? I'm watching the college game. I'm watching yeah, the NBA so game. Everything that, well, I went, shot clock, yes, because it translates for the kids. I mean, if they're doing it at the college level, why are we, why are we impeding that for their transition? Yeah, it's not Dean Smith right? four corners anymore, right? I mean, no, but you know, <laughs> we do run that anyway. But, uh, I, mean, I, I I would love it. So I'm I'm a coach that loves a good challenge, as you know. Obviously, yes. take it over, right? Right. So to me, it adds to the chess game. Now you got a shot clock. Right. Okay. So what are we running, and how good are you to run it, or how good are you to stop it? So Correct. To me, it totally changes the the coaching philosophy and the approach, literally game by game. How do we fix the free throw shooting in this county as it continues to dive? Practice. Just just shoot free throws, right? Do you know how many free throws we shot this summer? How many? A lot. Did you? My focus every day in the gym, most of it was free throws, Alan. I'm telling you. And it, it's like, look, okay, so they'll shoot 10, right? Right. Okay, come back and tell me how many you got. And then, we, we, of course, we have a goal. You, uh, we want you to hit 80%, right? That's your goal. Obviously, we would love 10 for 10, but let's be realistic here, okay? Right. So, we go, we go, all right. Oh, coach is great. I got eight. I got eight. Wow, you're really excited about that goal. All right, go get nine now. And so, we send them back. And then they get nine, and they get excited. Okay, well, if you can hit nine, you can hit 10. So, then they go back. So, we just play these, these little mind games with them and the free throws, and they work towards 10. And next thing you know, they're 10 for 10, and they're super stoked. And I'm like, great. Let's just be consistent now. The national you know? average for girls – is 53%. Yeah. Now, in Brevard County last year, we were 57%. Okay. Percent. Now, okay. I went uh, based on all the, the stats that I could find. Yeah, no doubt Emma Rich probably helped that total stay high. Yeah. So. The boys are, wor are worse. Oh, my God. The boys are even worse. Have you I, seen some form on some of those kids? It's, it's crazy. <laughs> the boys, the national average on the boys is actually 1% higher at 54. But here in Brevard County, they shot 53%. Wow. It's terrible. Yeah. That's tough to win games. Yeah. I, I, I know you, that from experience. You know, a lot of times you can go back and look, and that's the first thing you point to. Yes. You know, what did we do from the charity stripe? And they call it a charity stripe for a reason. Yes. Um, so what else? What else is going on? Oh, um, how about the rule on um, the free throw changes? Tell me about that. I don't know National what you're talking about. I don't know I don't what know you mean. We adopted it here in Florida. Yet. What is it? Uh, the college game. Five fouls, you're automatically shooting two in the quarter. So no longer a double bonus or a bonus. It so if you get five fouls, oh, well, how does that work in college? It's 20 minute halves. No, in girls, it's quarters. Oh, that's right. Girl, we're talking girls. Yes. Okay. Ah. Yeah, so if you commit five fouls, it's, you're shooting two free throws. What did you think? I like that. It's a huge strategy. Yeah, it really is. Yes. Because you really got to be careful now. And if you can't shoot free throws, I can, I'm can. i going to, you know, pick someone out of my bench there to help out. What did you think about the whole LSU uh, back and forth there? Um, what did you think about that whole? So, I was at the game. Okay. So, tell me I, about, I was, tell uh, me about I this. I was out in Dallas. I go to the... I go to the national convention every year, and then uh, sometimes I'll take in a game, mm -hmm. either both games or one of the games. And we're talking about Angel Reese. I actually bought a ticket and sat front row behind one of the baskets um, near LSU's bench. Uh -huh. And so I uh, was able to witness uh, all of the antics and uh, craziness between uh, LSU players and Iowa players uh -huh. and the coaching staff. And I'll be honest, Alan, I, I don't know how uh, Coach Mulkey did not get – one or multiple technical. I don't know either. She was dancing and yelling at the refs on the court the whole game. She was on the court. Um, if I did that in the sport, I would have been tossed quickly, very quickly. Yeah. Um, and so it doesn't really 
set a good example for coaches, let alone players. Um, I thought some of the blown up or blown out of proportion of Angel Reese's did Haley Van Lith palm and all that, and I, did, I just did Haley Van Lith get what she gave? Oh, you mean um, Caitlin Clark? Caitlin Clark, that's who I meant. Caitlin yes. Clark. Did Caitlin now, Clark get what she gave? I don't think so. I no? think she's just a competitor. Man. Yeah. I, 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 I think part of it, like you can compete, Alan. Right. And, you can, and, and you're going to do some things, right, as, a, as an athlete. Some of it's out-of-body experiences that you didn't even realize you were capable of doing because you're in the moment, right? Right. We, we've seen that happen in every <laughs> yeah, sport. Yeah, right? yes. But I, I think a lot of it, like I said, is kind of blown out of proportion. At what it, The media just jumped on it and ran with they it. They did. Instead of just letting it go. Kids are kids. Right. Right? No matter what the moment is, their kids are kids. Right? Yeah. And, and I thought the, uh, you know, the game was not managed well, in my opinion, by the officials. No, I agree. Right from the start. Right. And so I don't know what it was. It was one of the, the worst room, officiated games I've ever seen. It was definitely number one on my list. Alan. Yeah. And, and I kind of feel like I want my money back after watching Right. That. You know, I right. spent a lot of money for that ticket, Alan. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I just uh, – I think the, the officials kind of wanted to be a part of the show, and they ended up taking over what yeah. didn't need to be taken over. And nope. then they didn't control what they needed to control early enough to really settle it down. And, um, Do you, you know, karma's, karma's a you-know-what. And, and yeah. you know, LSU, they added Haley Van Lith. That's probably where you got that. Yes, one. yes, sorry. And then sorry. they added the other, the other stud from DePaul right. uh, as transfers – but I'll tell you what, if that UConn team stays healthy, those girls are not going to be easy to beat. Gino, I'd like to see Gina go get another one. I, it's close. Yeah. They just have to be healthy. I'd like to see Gino go get good. Of course, I think Notre Dame's going to be right there. I don't know how much of a uh, – Olivia Miles coming yeah, back should be, yeah. should be interesting. I, I don't know. You know, I think – I don't know. We'll see Emma contributing. Well, Emma, when do you think Emma will get a shit chance to correct that lineup? Think she'll start right away or – I haven't I haven't studied it much. Um, I was hoping to get out to um, to watch them play at least once this this coming season. So I'm ver I'm very curious to see how her roster plays out. She's, uh -huh. She picked up a couple transfers also in the transfer portal. Yeah. Um, so Coach Ivy definitely has some work to do in terms of figuring out what's the best balance for her rotation. Um, hopefully Emma gets a chance to. Who, get who's in your there. favorite college women's basketball team? I'm a UConn Husky. Okay. So, yeah, all right. Yeah, I, hear you. So I hear you. I, I just big, big UConn fan. Love it. Well, Coach, if you can believe this, we've gone for a half hour already, wow. man. That's yeah, crazy. it goes by fast, doesn't it? Does. it? Yes, sir. I love these summer series of interviews. And, of course, I always love uh, having you in. And uh, thank you so much for uh, coming in here uh, today. And be sure to get down to Melbourne and check out the Lady Bulldogs starting uh, coming up this uh, late October, November, I believe, is when – Season usually gets underway. But uh, if you'd be interested, limited spots and limited days left. So, if, But if you want to sit where Coach Turry's sitting right there on the bottom of your screen is the email address and there's the phone number. Uh, shoot us a text or send us an email and uh, we'll put you there. Uh, so we want to thank Caleb for producing and, uh, of course, Coach Turry. So for Coach Colin Turry, I'm Alan Slaughterzinski for the Brevard Sports Network Summer Series. Have a great night, everybody, and we'll see you real soon.